Good morning, happy Sabbath. It's nice to see all of you here. I don't, I'm not used to being up here, so if I make some mistakes, you can throw some green tomatoes at me and I'll take them home and fry them up. <laughs> As you know that this is camp meeting weekend up at, uh, where are they having it anyway? It's the same place? I'm sorry? Okay, you heard that, Mo Haven. Uh, in the past, our lead pastor's away, but we have our youth pastor here. And uh, I was telling Muncie Jenkins, it reminds me of years ago when we used to go to camp meeting up in um, Pennsylvania. And of course, singing in quartets, we always went to camp meetings. We'd start out on Friday night about seven or eight, drive all night. It was hot, it was humid, the car didn't have air conditioning. When we'd get there, we'd be so tired, we'd sleep through the service till it was time to sing. But it was wonderful because everybody was happy and then it was the second weekend, we'd turn around and do it all again. But those days are gone by. Uh, we have a couple of announcements here. There's a membership transfer. Let's see if I can read these right. Rafael Barbosa to Stoner Memorial Church in uh, MA, he's either in Maine or Mass probably Massachusetts and Isaac uh, Olatunji, who used to sing in our choir at <coughs> Columbus Eastwood Church. And let's see, Helen Smith Bennett from Apopka, Seventh-day Adventist Church from Apopka, Florida, I guess she's coming, coming here. And then Victor and uh, uh, all Alia asked to Asheville Foster, Foster Seventh-day Adventist Church in North Carolina. Now that I've muddled all over those, they're in the top of your bulletin there. So what we need is a motion, because this is a second transfer. Can we have a motion that these folks should go and come? Second? All in favor say aye. aye. So it's carried. Then next Sabbath is International Day, and I think Mrs. Alsman said that she still needed people to carry flags. So if you'd get in touch with her, because there's quite a few flags. I think I might be carrying one myself. I'll hobble down with it. And by the way, uh, some people are confused on the day that I'm supposed to have surgery. Now, I'm not asking for any donations. I'm just asking for your prayers. If you have a little extra money, though, I'll take it. We'll give it to the church. But it's on June 14th, and I'm having what they call a partial knee. They're not going to do the whole total knee. It's this one that clicks right here indicates that I'm getting old, so June 14th, it was the 13th and they changed it, so if everyone would pray for me for that. Then uh, there's a fellowship pot the next week on International Sabbath, and of course, uh, you know what that means. And read the rest of them, Vacation Bible School, in the, which is coming up, which I'm excited about, and all the other things, and there's all kinds of <clears throat> prayer meetings and breakfasts and things. There's a lot for us to do here, so join up and join in. So just before we have our most uh, first hymn of the morning, our opening hymn, everybody stand up and talk to each other for a minute. Hug, say good morning, happy Sabbath, I love you. If you, anybody stranger here, make it known, cause we are a friendly church. is okay the title of the song is right blessed assurance but the number is wrong hymn 462 
Stand with me and let's sing all three verses. Hymn 462, Blessed Assurance. Everybody up with me, please. before the Lord for prayer. May we all kneel down, please, as much as possible. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, who was is and will be there forever. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being called your children. We thank you for the privilege of being here on this Sabbath day to worship you. We thank you for the many blessings, my God and my Father, that you have bestowed upon us. We thank you, Lord, for the good week. We thank you also for the challenges of the week because you are there with us. We thank you, Lord, this morning for members of our church who are at the camp, and we ask, oh God, that as you bless us together this morning, you'll remember to bless them too. We thank you for those who among us are sick. And we remember to lift our brother Bob to you as he anticipates uh, a procedure, oh God, that you will be there. Be his doctor, oh God, and tell them what to do and show them what to do, dear Lord. And as he comes back singing and happy, we will remember to uh, be grateful and thank you because it is you. Oh God, we know that there are so many that are sick that we didn't get their names, 
We pray that you will meet them at the very point of their need, oh God. Those who cannot join us because they are bedridden or for one reason or the other cannot make it to church. Father God, may the blessings we thank you for this service. We believe and trust that it's not by accident that we are here today, but each one of us is going to that you have already arranged, oh God, according to your grace and mercy. We pray all this trusting and believing in the holy name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. May the deacons come up for the offering. Uh, <clears throat> I want to throw a challenge to you. Uh, somebody threw this challenge on our WhatsApp chat, and I thought it would be a good challenge for all of us. What if it is true? And the question was, if God was to use the money you give to church, the money you give as offering and tithe, if that was supposed to be used to build your mansion in heaven, how many of us would say my mansion is finished by now? It was a good challenge to me. It made me look at myself and see, how do I give? Would my mansion be uh, done by now if my offering was used to build it? Would I be homeless in heaven if my offering was used to build my house? So that's a challenge to all of us. Think about it. Let's pray. Father God, as we come to you to give that which you have given us, that which you have entrusted us with, oh God, we pray that each one of us will search his or her heart and see, am I giving according to the blessings I've received, or am I just carelessly using everything and giving nothing back to God? Lord, we are grateful that you don't give us according to what we have done, but according to your mercies and grace. For it's in Jesus' name I pray and believe that people will give according to the blessings you have given us. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
Thank you, Carolyn. That's one of the most beautiful versions I've ever heard of his eyes on the sparrow. Beautiful, beautiful. In the book of Romans, our Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are blessed with a forgiving Father who loves and cares for us. He knows our faults, our shortcomings, and he knows our needs. This is, he looked beyond my faults.
you. church family. We're going to start off our sermon time uh, with a children's story led out by uh, Chaplain Brooke Wong. So if the children can please make their way to the front, uh, we're going to have a children's story at this time. children come on down we have a few making their way we're gonna have you sit right up here on the front steps because everybody wants to look at you the perfect outfit on for today because today I'm going to tell you a couple stories about our dogs. Boys and girls, you're going to hear a lot of stories about our dogs. Their names are Willie and Chili. Willie and Chili Wong and this year they are four years old. They look a little bit alike. They're both black. Some are black. Uh, Chili is black and white. Uh, white paws, that is, and Willie is what they call silvering out. Apparently that's very fancy and very desirable. We don't know. But when we got Willie and Chili, we brought them home and we noticed that they were quite different. In fact, we named Chili, Chili, because he was a little bit reserved in his approach towards other people. He was not quite as outgoing. Willie, on the other hand, is very outgoing and he's never met a stranger before. Chili loves to run and he loves to exercise. <clears throat> and if you see him, you can tell that because he usually stays quite trim. However, Willie, when we take him out to exercise, he just lays down. And the last time we took him to the vet, the vet said, I think you need to help Willie lose weight because he's getting a little too chubby. When Chili is out and about, he acts like a dog. Willie acts like a person. Sometimes when we go to the park, Willie sits on the park benches. Those are for people, not for dogs. And Willie is type B, he's laid back and very relaxed and Chili is very type A, which has caused us a lot of children's stories for some of the naughty, naughty things that he's done. Boys and girls, we're in the process of moving right now and so we're moving some of the things in our house and when that happens, it usually gets a little bit tense, especially for Chili. He does not like it when furniture is moved around and when there's big boxes and he can tell that something is happening. So he starts to pace when he gets really, really nervous. Do you get nervous sometimes? Yeah. Well, when Chili gets nervous, he usually gets naughty and it's taken us a couple of years to figure this out, but we used to scold him when he would be naughty, when he would chew on something, we would say, no, no. And uh, when he would maybe drag something from one place, part of the house to another part, we would say, no, no, don't do that. But you know what we found, boys and girls? Chili really just needs a little bit more love. Can you say love? Love is what we all need. During times of change like this right now when we're living in a different place and it's a little smaller than our house and the dogs have never been there before, when Chili gets all nervous, he just needs a little bit more love. He needs to be picked up and he needs to be held and he needs to be petted. That's do have in common is that they love each other. Boys and girls, love is the answer for so very many of life's problems. Love is the answer for many of life's problems. And today we're going to talk about how love fits into the Christian's life as well. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Jesus, thank you for loving us. Help us to love each other like you do. In Jesus' name, all God's children said together, Amen. All right. Thanks for being good listeners, boys and girls. You can go back to your seats.
Thank you, Chaplain Wong, for that wonderful story. And Mr. Jenkins for that wonderful song. We really appreciate it. We really appreciate it. Well, good morning again. Happy Sabbath, church family. Uh, this is officially my first permanent Sabbath here as the new youth pastor here at the Worthington Church. Uh, my wife and I have moved in on Thursday. Uh, we're staying in an extended stay for about a month until our house uh, over in Westerville closes. And you guys have one thing uh, in, in Columbus that we really didn't have in Dayton, and that's traffic. I mean, good grief. Uh, on Thursday, I had a meeting in the evening, and, and it was about 20 minutes away, and I gave myself about 25 just to be safe. I drove on 270, and I was horrified with the, the, the traffic and how long it took. I actually was about 35 minutes late to my meeting. Um, so thank you for welcoming, welcoming my family and I to the Columbus area by your traffic. Uh, I, we really appreciate it, but that mistake will not happen again. Um, but um, in all seriousness, my wife and, our, and I are excited to be here. We're excited about the, what the Lord is doing here in Worthington, and we're excited uh, to be a part and to minister together with you um, to the people here at the Worthington Seventh Adventist Church. Um, so before we get started with our sermon, let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for speaking to us thus far through your music, through giving. And Lord, as we enter this time, I, we ask that you speak to us through your written word. We ask that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit, give us wisdom and understanding, and Lord, may all the distractions uh, be quieted around us, and may, we, and may we hear your voice and your voice alone. And Lord, may we not only hear your voice and the message you have for us this morning, but Father, may we internalize it, and may we leave here changed and transformed by your Spirit. May the words that come out of my mouth be yours and not mine, and hide me behind the shadow of the cross. And may your name and your name alone be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. What are you defined by? You know, a lot of people are defined by the money that they make. A lot of people are defined by their children or their grandchildren. A lot of people are defined by the career that they have. Or if you're a young person or a young adult, a lot of people are defined by the school that they go to or the person that they are dating. What are you defined by? A few years ago, there was a Special Olympics held in Seattle, Washington. And the event that would be talked about for years after was the 100-yard dash. And at the special event, there were nine contestants uh, competing at this event. And so the day came for the event to be held. And, and the nine young uh, children uh, were, were lined up at the starting line, waiting to hear the starting gun. Well, finally, they heard the starting gun, and, and they were off, running, laughing, making their way down to the finish line. All of a sudden, one of the contestants, he was a young boy, he started to stumble and he fell onto the asphalt and he started to cry. Well, the other eight contestants that were running heard the little cries of the young boy and they stopped in their tracks. They looked back at the young boy and all eight of them started to make their way to the little boy who was crying on the ground. There was a young girl who had Down syndrome and she stooped down to the little boy and she kissed him on the cheek and she said, there, that should make it feel better. And all eight grabbed the, the young boy, helped him to his feet and they all linked arms together and all nine walked hand in hand to the finish line. This day, those eight contestants were defined by their love. What are you defined by? Jesus commands us to be defined 
by our love, doesn't he? In fact, this command to love one another is so important to Jesus that he mentions it not once, not twice, not three times, but five different times in his last speech to his disciples that we find in John 13, 14, 15, and 16. So this must be an important command if Jesus mentions it five different times in his last speech. And in fact, three of those five times are found in our scripture reading this morning. Jesus wants us to be defined by our love. Let's open our Bibles and turn to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, verse 34. John chapter 13, verse 34. Take out your Bibles, your smartphone, your tablet, or uh, I believe it's uh, uh, written here up on the screen. John 13, verse 34. The Word of God says, John 14, or excuse me, John 13, verse 34, it says this, A new command, this is Jesus speaking, a new command I give you. What is that command? The command, Jesus says, love one another. As I have loved you, you so you must love one another. In this verse, Jesus commands us to be defined by our love. Now let's break this verse down, verse 34, real quick. Jesus says that this command was a new commandment. Now, you Bible scholars, was this really a new commandment that Jesus just made up? No, this wasn't a new commandment. This was a commandment that was instilled in place, and any good Jewish person would know that Jesus was quoting from the Torah. Jesus was quoting from Moses when he said, love one another. Now, why, then why did Jesus say it was a new commandment? Well, Jesus said it was a new commandment because it's an old commandment wrapped up in new packaging. You see, up until this time in human history, God had never shown his love by bringing down, by allowing his son to come down in human flesh. Never in human history had we seen God's love portrayed so fully than in the life of Jesus. That's why Jesus said it's a new commandment. It's a new commandment because now we know how God loves. And we know that because of what Jesus has done and how he lived his life. That's why Jesus said, love another as I have loved you. Now the question is, my friends, well, how did Jesus love? There's a story of a stock market uh, boy. Um, his name was Kurt. And one day he was working at the stock market, um, or not stock market, the grocery uh, store, and he was a stock boy. I'm sorry. I uh, got that mixed up. Uh, he's a stock boy. He's working at the grocery store. And one day he was uh, putting away uh, stocking groceries, and there was a voice over the intercom. And the voice said that uh, a customer needed help carrying the groceries out to the car. Well, Kurt was almost finished with his shift that day, and he wanted some fresh air, so he decided to go and help the customer. Well, on his way to help the customer to take the groceries outside, he saw a distant smile that caught his eye. As he took a closer look, he looked and he saw the most beautiful woman he had ever seen before. It was the new cash out uh, 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 clerk at the grocery store. And as the day went on, he thought to himself, I need to know what this new girl's name is. And so he decided after work that he was going to stand right by the checkout counter and he was going to figure out who this girl was, what her name was. Well, sure enough, this young lady came in to, uh, to check out the clock out. She smiled at Kurt, picked up her time card, punched it in, and put it back in the slot. Well, Kurt uh, went over to the, to the, to the um, slot. He picked up the card, and he read what was on top of the card, and he found out 
that her name was Brenda. And so he put the card back and he walked outside wanting to talk to Brenda, but as he got out to the street, he saw that Brenda was walking on her way home. Well, the next day, Kurt was determined to talk to Brenda, and so after work, he stood at the checkout uh, clock again, and he, as Brenda came, he, he talked with her, and he offered to give her a ride home. And so Brenda agreed, and, and Kurt drove her home, and um, they were at her house, and, and before she got out of the car, he said, hey, can we see each other again? Well, Brenda was a little hesitant, and she came up with an excuse after excuse on why they couldn't see each other again. But Kurt was very persistent. Finally, they agreed that that coming Saturday evening, that they were going to go out on a date. Well, Saturday evening came, Kurt dressed up in his best, and he came to Brenda's house, and he knocked on the door. <laughs> Brenda opened the door, and she saw Kurt there, and she said, Kurt, I'm so sorry. The babysitter that was supposed to babysit my kids didn't make it, and so we can't go on our date. Well, Kurt wouldn't take no for an answer, and so he said, oh, don't worry, that's fine. Your kids can come with us on the date. And then Brenda, again, was a little hesitant. She made excuses, and she said, no, but my son has Down syndrome, and he's paraplegic, and he, he, it's just going to be too much. But Kurt didn't take no for an answer. He said, no problem. We can take care. I'll take care of him. They can come with us on the date. And so Brenda finally said, okay, and the kids came with them on the date. They went out to a restaurant, and Kurt treated her two kids like they were his own. He... He spent time with them. He talked with them. When, he, when Brenda's son had to go to the restroom, Kurt would pick him up out of the wheelchair and carry him to the restroom and help him use the bathroom and then carry him back. Then they went to the movies after that and he did the same exact thing, helping Brenda out. After the date, Brenda knew that this was the man that she was going to marry because of his unselfish, unconditional love. And a year later, sure enough, Brenda and Kurt was married. Now, whatever happened to Kurt, the stock boy? Well, Kurt, the stock boy, went on to get drafted by the St. Louis Rams as a quarterback and also went on to get traded to the Arizona Cardinals. And Kurt, the stock boy, is actually going to be inducted into the Football Hall of Fame this coming August. Kurt, the stock boy, was Kurt Warner, the all-time quarterback. You see, Kurt Warner showed us a picture, a little taste of what Jesus did for us, didn't he? You see, Jesus was unconditional in his love towards us. Jesus didn't hold our past against us. No, Jesus didn't even make us change before he came to us. No, Jesus came to us in our sin-sick condition. Jesus came to us when we were enemies. The Bible says, Paul even says, while we were yet sinners and while we were enemies to Christ, Jesus came and died for us. You see, Jesus didn't show conditional love. Jesus showed unconditional love. And Jesus came and, and showed us how to love each other. And, it, and it's this type of love that Jesus is asking us to show one another. Jesus is asking us to show unconditional love. This command to show love to everyone is Jesus' command. May we be defined by love. You know, we all agree with this principle. In principle, right? We sing about it. We read about it. We talk about it. We preach about it. We even teach about it. This principle of love. And there's no right-thinking Christian that will disagree with the command that Jesus gave to love one another. But you see, my friends, we let's be honest with ourselves for a minute. Let's be honest. Let's be authentic. If we're honest with ourselves, we will say that it is sometimes hard to love certain people. Amen? Amen? Especially sometimes, most of the time, people in the church. For some reason, sometimes it's hard to love people in the church. We love in the abstract. We, we agree with the principle in the abstract. But when it comes to the concrete, when it comes 
to the actual reality of practicing it, we struggle with it. There was a story of a dad who just repaved his driveway. And there, and there was still wet concrete on the driveway. And, and so he took some poles and, and some caution tape and he, he made a barrier around his driveway. And then the next thing he did is he came or he went to his two-year-old son. And he said, son, do not run on the driveway. And the son said, okay. And went on to play with his toys outside. The dad didn't think anything of it. He walked into the house, and he was uh, by the kitchen, washing his hands, looking out the window. And what do you know? Those of you who are parents will know that toddlers have memory like a goldfish. Um, and what do you know? His little son came running around the house, making a beeline for the driveway. And uh, it was almost like he was looking out the window. It's almost like in slow motion. He saw his son splat. Splat, splat, right into his newly paved driveway. Well, as the father was looking at this, his blood pressure started to rise, his face started to redden, and he stomped out of the house and he went over to his son and he said, Son, I told you not to run on the driveway. And he was scolding his son and yelling at his son. Well, his wife came outside. A lot of times, sometimes your wife is usually the voice of reason. Um, your wife, his wife came outside and she put her arm around her husband and she said, Honey, 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 remember, you love your son. You love your son. You love your son. The father stopped, thought for a moment, looked at his wife, and he said, Yes, I love my son in the abstract, but I don't love him in the concrete. <laughs> My friends, sometimes we're like that, aren't we? We love in the abstract, but we have a hard time loving in the concrete, don't we? There's an old saying that says, to live with the saints in heaven above, oh, that will be glory. But to live with the saints on earth below, well, that is quite another story. We chuckle because we know it's true. But my friends, however we feel or whatever we may think, Jesus' command is crystal clear when he says, love one another. May we be defined by love. Now you might be saying, well, wait a second, wait a second, Pastor, wait a second. I know I have to love people, and it's easy to love the person that's nice to me. It's always easy. But you're, 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 you're actually saying to me this morning, you're actually telling me that I have to love the person that annoys me. I have to love my spouse that sometimes gets on my nerves. Or I have to love my children that sometimes get on my nerves. Or I have to love that boss or that co-worker or that neighbor or that uh, uh, friend at school or that person at school or your sibling. You mean them? You mean I have to love the person that stabbed me in the back? You mean I have to love the person that emotionally hurt me? Are you telling me, Pastor, that I have to love the person that gives me dirty looks at church? And my friends, my answer is clear this morning because it comes from Scripture. Jesus actually answers this question. He says, yes, love one another. My friends, no matter how we feel, no matter what we think, no matter the situation or what may present itself, God's word doesn't change. And Jesus' command doesn't change with time. It's still crystal clear 2,000 years later when he says, love one another. And if you notice the context, my friends, he wasn't talking to people outside. He wasn't talking to people outside. He was talking to his disciples, his church. When he said, love one another. So my friends, Jesus' command is especially clear when he says, love people in the church. May we be defined by love. My friends, we do no favors to ourselves when we encourage and uplift visitors, but we gossip and tear our brothers and sisters down in church. 
We do ourselves no favors when we, are on, when we are kind to our visitors, but we are unkind to our brothers and our sisters in church. We do ourselves no favors when we speak kindly to our visitors, but we criticize our brothers and our sisters in church. My friends, even if we do not like each other, we should love each other. May we be defined by love. But you might be asking, well, Pastor, I agree with you, but you don't know the person that did that to me. You don't know what they did to me. Or you don't know the situation. You don't know the hurt they brought in my life. You don't understand how much I've been wronged. How do I love that person? How do I love the unlovable? My friends, this morning we're going to discuss three principles. Three principles quickly on how we can love the unlovable. Principle number one. Principle number one. Realize I am a sinner in the eyes of God. Realize I'm a sinner in the eyes of God. My friend Romans 6.23 says, All have come short of the glory of God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. My friends, we need to come to a point where we realize that all of our sin is offensive to God. Sometimes when we have been in church for a long time, we tend to think of ourselves as holier than everyone else because we've been at church a long time and we don't seem to understand that our petty church sins is just as offensive as other sins. At church, we sometimes tend to rank sins, don't we? We, we rank a sin down here and then we have our sins up here and then these are the sins that if you show it in church, you, you, you should be kicked out of the church. And then we tend to, 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 to judge ourselves based on the standard. And we think to ourselves, as long as my sin is not up here, I'm okay. My friends, all sin is offensive to God. Yes, there are certain sins that, that do more damage. Some sins that do more damage. But as far as the sin itself, sin is sin and all is offensive to God. And you are guilty of murdering the Son of God. All sin killed the Son of God. My friends, we are just as guilty for that judgmental look you gave the person who walked into church late than someone who openly defies and curses God. You are just as guilty of murdering Jesus than by gossiping about the pastor over Sabbath lunch. Then you are but the person for the person who cusses every other word. You are just as guilty of murdering Jesus by lusting after that person than you are a serial rapist. My friends, sin is sin. And all is offensive. And when we come to the a place in our spiritual life when we understand our sin, my sin, my sin, even though they're petty church sins, but my sin is just as offensive and I am just as guilty for murdering the Son of God. When we come to that conclusion in our life, we're going to look at other people differently. We're going to look at other people differently because we're going to see those people as sinners saved by grace just like us. Principle number one. Realize we are sinners in the eyes of God. All of us need the righteousness of Christ. Amen. All of us need God's grace. It doesn't matter how long we've been in a relationship with Jesus. We still need his grace. May we be defined by love. Principle number two. Love is not a feeling. Love is an action. Now, there's a theory out there that says that um, your decision of doing something is based on whether you feel like doing it or not. And in some cases, that's okay. In some cases, that's fine. But when it comes to your spiritual life, my friends, if you base your spiritual decisions in your spiritual life based on if you feel like it or not, you're in trouble. Because let me tell you, my friends, we are sinners and we have sinful hearts. And there are going to be times when we don't feel like doing the right thing. But that doesn't mean, that doesn't negate the fact that we should still do the right thing. When it comes to spirituality, my friends, feelings don't uh, precede action. Action, or feelings follow action. 
Feelings follow action. So my friends, when it comes to that person that you have a hard time loving, and you realize that you're a sinner in the eyes of God, now you have to choose to love that person. And you have to force yourself to love that person. Yes, it's going to be hard at first, but you need to choose to act. I'm going to love that person. I don't care how I feel. I don't care what they do to me. I'm going to love you. And you decide that you're going to love. And after you base it on principle, and after you do it over and over and over again, then the feelings will come. And it will make it a lot easier to love the person. My friends, if we do not ask the Lord to help us choose to love people, we, the results are going to be disastrous. Auntie Ellen, in her book, Acts of the Apostles, she's talking about the early church and she's talking about how in the early church they loved each other and they were unified and, and, and they were all of one accord and, and they did stuff for each other and they lifted each other up. But then she continues in, um, excuse me, sorry. Then she continues in uh, page 548. She says, but gradually a change came. What was that change? The change is this. The believers began to look for defects in others, dwelling upon mistakes, giving place to unkind criticism. They lost sight of the Savior and His love. They became more strict in regard to outward ceremony, more particular about the theory than the practice of the faith. In the zeal to condemn others, they overlooked their own errors. They lost the brotherly love that Christ had enjoined and saddest of all, they were unconscious of their loss. She continues on. It is not the opposition of the world that most endangers the church of Christ. Well, what is? She answers and she says, it is the evil cherished in the hearts of who? Believers. The evil cherished in the hearts of believers that works the most gravest disaster and most surely retards the progress of God's cause. Well, what is that evil? She answers that again. There is no surer way of weakening spirituality than by cherishing envy, suspicion, fault-finding, and evil surmising. On the other hand, the strongest witness that God has sent His Son into this world is the existence of harmony and union among men of varied dispositions who form His church. My friends, if we don't love each other, we're going to start fighting each other. And what happened at the early, in the early church is going to happen again. It's going to happen again. She says the best witness that Jesus has come into this world is the unity and harmony among men of varied dispositions, which means it is okay to disagree. Sometimes we think that we always need to be right. And if we disagree with someone, then we draw lines and we say, you're wrong, I'm right. My friends, when it comes to issues that are not salvific, again, that's a disclaimer, salvific, Bible doctrines are salvific. When it doesn't come to those, you can disagree. God's church is big enough for people with varied dispositions. Amen. That means that those who believe in women's ordination and those who do not can still be in the same church. Those who believe that you should be a vegan and those who eat meat. And still be disagreeing on some issues, but love each other. Jesus says, Jesus says that that is the best witness. That is the best witness that the church can have. Principle number one, realize we're the we're sinner in the eyes of God. Principle number two, love is an action, not a feeling. Principle number three, we need to spend time at the feet of Jesus. Because my friends, only Jesus can change an unloving heart to loving hearts. Only Jesus can change a suspicious heart to a heart of trust. Only Jesus can change a criticizing tongue to a tongue of encouraging. Only Jesus can change people's hearts. So if we want to love the unlovable, we need to realize first we're sinners. 
We need to realize that love is an action, not a feeling. And we need to be at Jesus' feet, asking him to change our hearts. 1 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old has gone, the new has come. So my friends, according to this text, according to the Apostle Paul, we are new creatures when we're in Jesus. That means we can love the person that we cannot love. That means we can be nice to the person that's hard to be nice to. That means we can love the person that annoys us and gets under our skin. When Jesus takes over the heart, we can love the unlovable. May we be defined by love. When we follow these three principles, my friend, the Bible tells us what happens after that. In our scripture this morning, John 13, verse 35, starting in 35 now, it says, By this, meaning our love for one another, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. If you love one another. If we love one another, my friends, people out there will know that we are followers of Jesus. May we be defined by our love. Dale Davis is a 58-year-old blues musician and author. And Dale Davis single-handedly converted 200 members of the KKK. He even almost eliminated the KK group in a part of Maryland. Now we might be tempted to think that Daryl Davis was a Caucasian man. But in fact, Daryl Davis was an African American. Now you might be asking, how can an African American man convert 200 members of a group that have vowed to hate his race? Daryl Davis tells us he did it by loving them, by showing them kindness. That's what he did. He treated them like he would want to be treated, and he won them over. And at the end of the day, love won. And 200 members of a racist group who hate African Americans came out of that group because of an African American who loved them. My friends, what would happen if that type of love existed in God's church? What, type, what would happen if that type of love existed in God's church? My friends, there would be powerful things happening in this church. I challenge us this morning to be defined by our love for one another. We need to start loving each other. We need to quit bickering and criticizing each other. We need to love each other. I long for the day. Maybe, maybe it's happening now. I don't know. I haven't been in this church. But I long for the day when someone can walk through those doors and they come into this church and they say, something is different about this church. Something is different about this church. And may that difference, may that difference be our love for one another. Amen. May we be defined by our love. I'm going to end with a challenge. Because in order for the church to be known for our love, each individual member needs to decide to be loving. So my challenge to you this week, as the sermon was going on, I'm sure there was that specific individual that came to your mind. That individual that's hard to love, hard to get along with. My challenge to you this week is to do something nice for that individual. Write them a card. Go out of your way to show them the love of Jesus. That's my challenge. Because it's all good and all to hear this message at church. But if it goes in one ear and goes out the other, and by Saturday evening we're acting like devils, then it does us no good. 
We need to start doing this practically. So that's my challenge. And next week, if you've accepted my challenge, next week I want to hear the stories. I want to hear the stories. When I preached the sermon last, um, I was at Seneville at the time, just a short story. When I preached the sermon, one of our elders' son was in the congregation. And he was having a hard time with his co-worker, one of his co-workers. And uh, he was bickering, and, and there was a, a lot of tension that, were ha that was happening. And as the, as the sermon went on, the Holy Spirit started to convict him and convict him. And finally, after the sermon, he said, I'm going to take the challenge. And he went back home, and he emailed his co-worker that he had trouble with. And he said, I'm sorry for what I've done. Please forgive me. I don't want this tension. And he made amends with his co-worker. What will happen if that happens here? Oh, my friends, great things will happen. If we can just put down our pride, take some humility, and make amends, and love each other like Jesus loved us. I challenge us, may we be defined by our love. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number... 518. Oh, oh, 517. Oh, 579. I'm sorry. Hymn number 579. This love that makes us happy. Our church secretary was thinking in the abstract instead of the concrete when she put this down. 579. Let's all stand together. That was a wonderful sermon, Pastor. Wonderful. Let's all stand together again, 579.
Forgive us, Lord, for times that we haven't done that. And may you provide us the grace we need to live more and more like your Son in loving others. This is our prayer in Jesus' name.